In order to avoid the worst effects of climate change, we need to move towards a plant-based diet. Currently, Ireland imports most of the fruit and veg that we eat. This has huge financial and environmental costs. But does it have to be this way? The Netherlands, with a similar climate to Ireland, exports 94 billion euro worth of food products, dwarfing Ireland's 12 billion euro of exports. All of this on a land area the size of Munster. The reason for their success is their extensive use of glasshouse growing. Could Ireland learn from the Netherlands' success? My grandfather grew fr fruit for jam. My mother, obviously, as part of the family, picked fruit for many years, talked about it. And my uncle was growing a lot of fruit. And I bought fruit off him to start with. So we start growing fruit. Things didn't go as planned. Oh, we didn't wow. read the manuals. What happened? We lost our first crop. So that happened a couple of times over. And then Chagas was doing a trip abroad to Spain. A huge eye-opener because they were at the East forever, from generation to generation. So that was penny dropped. If you're going to grow fruit, you have to have nice big tunnels to create a perfect environment. And you know what they say, the easiest way for you to understand it is to walk through it. Eamon Crean has six kilometres of polytunnels on his 24 acres of land here in County Wexford. <laughs> hey! How do I look? Excellent. <laughs> polytunnels offer many of the advantages of glasshouses. A controlled environment at a smaller cost, which means a long growing season, amazing efficiency, and a predictable crop on a very small footprint of land. The berries are all hand-picked. And it's not as easy as it looks. Oh. <laughs> I really don't think I'm very cut out for this. <laughs> I actually am so bad at it. Well, Eamon, it's looking pretty full now. What's yes. the plan? Your job is done. Oh, my God. So will I take this with me? You can indeed. All we'll right. go down to quality. Let's go. Let's we'll check it. I'm very nervous right now. <laughs> can you do it? It's a three kilo. That's awesome. 450 grams short. Oh, God. <laughs> and if I'd done it right, where would it go now? Three kilos, and it would then go into the van. OK. The van leaves every half an hour to chill the fruit. It's a very important process once we've picked the fruit okay. to chill it as quick as possible down to four degrees. The fruit is chilled, sorted, weighed, and then packaged for sale. Not all of the environmental impacts have yet been solved. But growing our own food here instead of importing is a big step in the right direction. In general, all Irish berries are sold within the Irish market. So we depend on Irish people to grow this market, and that's why we're here. They are growing this market, they are buying our fruit. Um, our fruit would go, we sell a lot of fruit on the side of the roads for the last 30 years. A lot of our raspberries, blackberries and strawberries end up on the shelves in Aldi with our name on the bonnet. So you don't export your fruit at all? It's all eaten in Ireland? All eaten in Ireland. We've basically, in the last 20 years, replaced that complete imported product. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it all gets eaten. So that's hundreds of thousands of euro worth of Irish food grown here. Yeah. This enterprise employs 20 full-time and 130 part-time workers, generating millions of euro in revenues to the local area, all on a 24-acre farm. 50% of our cost is labour. So if somebody buys, spends 20 euros a week on fruit, they've literally employed someone for two hours. It's a very, very specialised job, and they need to be paid as specialised people. Tell me about the tunnels, because they look very expensive to set up. Did you have to pay entirely for all of these yourself? No, we didn't. The Irish government is quite supportive and have been for years. So you're trying to build your tunnels and you're trying to build your market. So, yeah, we get grants each year towards um, developing. So that's a huge help in time because it's a very, very expensive process. And do you think it would be possible to have done this without the subsidies from the government? Oh, absolutely not. Margins, we work on very small margins. We're trying to develop an industry and it takes a massive support system to do so. But could we take this technology and grow other things that we have to import? Tomatoes, other... Can we, can we take lessons from this? We can grow anything that needs any... We can grow an amazing amount of things. We can create a climate within a glass house, the climate within tunnels to do things that we never even imagined. 
amazing to see this small food producer blossom into a major business in the southeast. Simple technologies like polytunnels and greenhouses are a way for us to grow much more of our own food here in Ireland. But, despite the success here at Greenhills with fruit farming, Ireland still imports hundreds of millions of euro worth of fruit and veg every year. Much of this could easily be grown here. In North County Dublin, I'm meeting a representative of the horticulture industry to understand what we can do to expand this sector to produce more Irish food for Irish plates. One is horticulture in Ireland is a big business. Um, it is, if we, if we look at value, uh, I suppose strangely enough, the, it's uh, horticulture in total only covers 0.5% of our agricultural land. So, uh, but out of that 0.5%, it produces 437 million worth at farm gate value. That was in 2018. That is just a huge amount of money from such a tiny amount of land. The thing with, with fruit and veg is that it's a very competitive environment. Supermarkets, you'll often see them uh, selling veg at 49 cents, 89 cents, so the margins are tiny. In fact, in some cases, they're losing money. And if you take it that 90% of the retail sales of fruit and veg are within five supermarkets, that makes each of those supermarkets incredibly strong. And if you're dealing with an individual grower, um, that means that person hasn't got very much room to negotiate. And what's even more worrying is that the tradition in these farms, these generations of people that have grown, um, grown crops, the children are not going in because they see the difficulty, they see the stress. And we're at a point now where we really have to change policy or we won't have an industry. So five of the big supermarkets control 90% of the market. That's, I mean, not the definition of, but it's not far from a monopoly. So they can control what they pay to these farmers. Yeah, more, more or less. And, and that's exacerbated by the fact that each of the, you're dealing with some relatively small suppliers, you know? And the other thing is that it's very easy for big groups like that to import. And in Ireland, our scale of production is much smaller. In the UK, for instance, the average, say, vegetable, field vegetable farm would be 20 times the size. So if you look at that scale of operation, your unit cost is a lot lower. It just seems like a no-brainer. We have the ability to grow the food. We have people who are starting to want the food. We have the ability to make money from the food. So we really need to get behind this. Bottom of all, this is commercialism as well. So you've got to be able to make money. And young people coming into it have got to see it as a career path that's profitable. And we also then need the government to come into with proactive policies as well, certainly in the terms of research, certainly in the terms of looking at the structures and the marketing, doing what they can to make sure that there's a balance between the retailer and the, and the producer. If we get those three areas coming together, I think we have a wonderful future. So Ireland's got to decide, does it want to opt into the change and trend into plant-based diets, or are we going to ignore it? With existing technologies, we can do so much more to grow our own food here in Ireland. But we've got used to easy access to out-of-season imported foods. It's hard to change habits. If only there was a way to grow a large variety of seasonal and local food sustainably 365 days of the year. What we need is new technologies in agriculture that will revolutionise the whole industry as much as the plough or even the tractor. Now I didn't think I'd find them in an industrial estate in West Dublin, but there is a new food startup here that has the potential to change everything. Farmony is a new Irish startup that specialises in vertical farming technologies. Hey John Paul, hey, how are you? Nice Lovely to meet you, to welcome to Farmony. Do you want to check out the farm? Perfect, thank you, that Thanks sounds you. great, thank you. Okay, so here it is, welcome to Farmony. Wow, look at this, this is great. So five acres of traditional farmland, the output equivalent from just 55 square metres. Five acres of traditional yeah, farmland so over right a, here? Yeah, so over a 12 month period, uh, the output equivalent from just 55. Five acres. Yeah, so 55 square metres of wow. growth space. Vertical 3D farming has become one of the most talked about technologies in food innovation today. An extraordinary amount of food can be grown on a very small parcel of land with a tiny amount of resources. So, so this is basil. This is basil. Can I take a leaf off? Yeah, do. Great. 
Oh, that is amazing. So, yeah. That is gorgeous. To show you, uh, you'll see the roots. Oh, look at that. Okay, so you see how clear the roots are? So there's no soil. You no don't soil. need anything. It just goes straight yeah. into the water. So this is your water recircling and nutrients are added as the plants require. And how do you get away without pesticides? Is it just because it's a closed environment? Yeah, so it's controlled. This is like plant heaven. Uh, <laughs> it's 21 degrees. We give the plants just the optimum nutrition that they require. Um, and yeah, it's pesticide free because you're in this control. And what's over the other side? This indoor growing means crops are sheltered from extreme weather. And the high density production means food can be grown right where it's consumed instead of shipped around the world. I mean, this all looks amazing, but it also looks amazingly expensive. How much is buying one of these units? No, not, not, not expensive. You know, you're looking at about, for this particular configuration, you're looking at about 80,000 euros. Um, and then as regards your return on investment, that would probably be within one to two years. So to give you an example, if you were to grow microgreens and you've got 24 trays per week by your 17 modules, you need to understand plants and plant health. Um, and then there's the sales aspect as well. If you were at optimum output, you'd be in a turnover of over 200,000. And then the lights, do you just put these on all day or how does it work? No, so actually what we do with the lighting, um, we have it on uh, today for you guys to demonstrate, but normally the lights would be on uh, overnight. So that's your cheapest electricity bill. For these to be truly sustainable, they could easily run fully on renewable energy. And I mean, it's so fresh, there has to be way more vitamins and nutrients in it. So we've had like some of the top chefs in Dublin out here and thankfully their reaction is similar yeah, to yours. It's, it's like, so, wow. It's so strong actually. Yeah. You'd probably need to use almost less of it because it's so strong. Yeah, it's so, so you can imagine, you know, if it's coming from as far afield as Israel and it's been put on trucks, put in plastic, flown across to Dublin, uh, and then transport it around the country, it's going to lose a lot of that power that you're tasting. Yeah, and a lot of the nutrients and everything. Currently, the business model works for high-value microgreens. But in the future, this technology has big potential for all kinds of local food growing. Amazing to see how technology can play a big part in the solutions for food in the years ahead. But... We're a long way from having a truly climate-friendly food system. For the future of food to be sustainable, it will require vision, supported by policy, new technologies, and most importantly, a big shift in our food choices. Every time we buy food, we make a choice that affects the health of our planet. Reducing food waste while choosing local, in season, and not always making meat the star of the show, is a good start. What we eat could make all the difference.